hospital and welcome you all here today uh, for our special session. Uh, we have thanks to our partners, uh, Australia's Royal Chamber of Commerce, Australia UAE, the Business Council. Uh, we have also from Australia, New Zealand Trade and Enterprise, and from the Bridge Hub, a wonderful partners. Uh, for those of you 10 o'clock in the morning in Israel, shalom. For those of you in UAE, 11 o'clock in the morning, salam. For our Australian colleagues, five o'clock in the afternoon, we pay our respects to the elders, past, present, and to our New Zealand colleagues at 7 p.m. Kia ora, and uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, today's session follows the first panel discussion that we've had with UAE, Israel, Australia, and New Zealand. The Abraham Accords, signed in September last year, were transformational, as we will hear uh, from the two special guests of honour from both embassies. For Australia and New Zealand, this area opens up new markets and new potential for cooperation and development. And the uh, objective of these panels is to find areas where we can help each other. The circle has a history of we look forward in February next year to go to Expo 2020 in Dubai, where Australia, New Zealand and Israel have major stands. And we'll hope we'll be taking our first ever UAE Israel study tour trade mission uh, to Expo 2020 in Dubai and then on to Israel. Further details will be forwarded, vaccines willing. So ladies and gentlemen, a special welcome to our panel here today. Uh, Beda bin Mubarak is Chief Executive Officer of Fish Farm LLC in Dubai. Tom Etzach is Chief Executive of CropEx in Israel. Stu Adam, Co-Founder and Director Agronomai in Australia. And Amos Bolfreeman, Business Development Manager, Food HQ and Head of Partnerships at Sprout in New Zealand. We have a wonderful moderator today, Diana Somerville, who's a Community Manager at Bridge Hub. We encourage all of you to listen and then use the Q&A chat session, uh, Q&A session and chat to submit questions, try and we'll try and get through as many as possible. And we promise that we will finish on time. We hope that you learn a lot, we share a lot, and we all grow our business relationships a lot. So we're now here with the great the distinction uh, and representatives of the embassies of Israel in the UAE. Firstly, Ron Gerstenfeld is Deputy Chief of Mission at the Israeli Embassy in Canberra. And we're here, then we'll hear the Head of Economic Affairs from the Embassy of the UAE in Canberra, Mr. Majid Ahmed Ahmed El Nekalawi, both of whom have been wonderful partners to the circle in putting our panel together. Ladies and gentlemen, enjoy the session. Please welcome Ron, followed by Majid. Thank you. Well, thank you very, very much, Johnny. Really excited uh, to be with you, even though virtually. So thanks. Uh, first of all, to the trans Tasman Business Circle, Johnny and the team. Um, Majid, uh, great to meet you again. I know that you're far away in Abu Dhabi at the moment. Hope to see you here soon with us. Uh, Johnny, you asked me to speak about the big picture of the relation of the business relation. So I would say a few words that peace is wonderful. And this is the most important things to enhance and, and emphasize. It's wonderful for government to government relations. It's wonderful for cultural relations. It's amazing for cultural relation. And it's more amazing even for the business sectors. Since the uh, signing uh, on the Abraham Accords peace agreement between Israel and the UAE in September last year, more than 90 bilateral agreements, commercial agreements uh, across many sectors have been signed by both countries. A lot of them, by the way, in those special sectors of water uh, security and food security. I will give some example, recent example. In February 2021, Israeli vertical farm company, Future Corp signed an MOU with the Abu Dhabi based United Eastern Group to establish a facility for growing various corps in the UAE using vertical agriculture technology. January 2021, Israeli Acta company Vertical Field signed an agreement with the Emirates Smart Solution and Technology and Technologies to launch a vertical farm pilot projects in the Emirate of Um Al Quwain. In January 2021, a high-level delegation from the Israeli Mekorot Water Company 
conduct discussion uh, with the Under Secretary of the Ministry of Energy and Infrastructure of, uh, uh, for Energy and the Petroleum Affair of the UAE to pursue cooperation in the field. December 2020, Israeli wastewater treatment solution company signed an agreement with Dubai-based Oasis Investment to collaborate on water filtration technology and many, many more that already been signed and many, many more to come. So actually what I want to say, and this is for our respective guests and our listeners, this is a call for action, mainly for Australian and New Zealanders that are here with us. Come, see, do business with us in the region and invest in our region. I'm sure Majid will agree with me because it's very dynamic, innovative, uh, with a lot of opportunities and peace bring more and more opportunities. So thank you very much for having me and please Majid, the floor is yours. Thank you, Johnny, for the warm welcome. And uh, thank you, Ron, for what you've just said. Um, I'm going to start first, you know, by talking about the Abraham Accords. Um, the accord represents more than simply the establishment of relations. The Abraham Accords are a fresh approach to achieving peace, stability, and prosperity for the whole region, and ultimately the entire world. Peace between the UAE and Israel is only the first step towards this goal. Though the Abraham Accords, two of the world's most dynamic and advanced societies are creating a linked and powerful engine of progress and opportunity. In turn, our countries will unlock the potential of the entire region in many sectors. For example, health, logistics, aviation, energy, tourism, education, agriculture, and science and technology. Food and water security, which is the topic of today's panel, matters to both countries and will be one of the sectors of cooperation now and in the future. In September 2020, the Emirati Minister of State for Food Security, Her Excellency Maryam al Meheri, had a virtual meeting with the Israeli Minister for Agriculture. And they both discussed opportunities for closer co collaboration in achieving better uh, food and water security outcomes for both the UAE and Israel. Both countries have made significant investments in agricultural and water research in recent years, and they've focused on the de development to find innovative uh, methods to produce food and conserve water in a very arid region. For the UAE, food and water, uh, food and water security are strategic in the coming decades. The UAE has its national food security strategy, which aims to make the UAE the most food secure country by 2051. Last year's pandemic affected global food supplies and posed a challenge to the entire world. The UAE began intensifying its research in finding the best technologies for its food and water security through collaboration. For example, rice is a food staple in the UAE. And last year, the Ministry of Climate Change and Environment announced a joint research program with the Republic of Korea aimed at cultivating rice in the desert. The ministry said that if successful, this project will have the potential to shape the future of agriculture and be replicated in other arid regions. There's also innovation at the private sector level. Today, we have uh, uh, Badr bin Mubarak, the CEO of Fish Farm, and companies such as Fish Farm contribute to the UAE's national food security strategy with their innovative solutions. Not many people know that Fish Farm is the world's fourth biggest facility in terms of producing organic salmon and the only one with full environmental control. And I'm sure we'll hear more about what Fish Farm is doing from better in today's panel. Closer to today's topic, companies from the UAE and Israel are already collaborating on that area. Uh, I know Ron has already mentioned the number of uh, agreements, MOUs, and partnerships already signed between the private sector in both the UAE and Israel since the, the accord was signed. And he's already referred to some of those partnerships. Um, uh, one stands out as well, which is the partnership in water security between UAE's Al Dahra and Israel's Watergen, which was signed last November. This is what the Abraham Accords brings to the table a fresh approach 
to dealing with the region's challenges, ones that affect us all as humans. The Abraham Accords will be remembered as one of the major turning points in the history of the Middle East. The future will be more peaceful, stable, and prosperous if we are able to take advantages of the opportunities this accord has presented us. Thank you. Thank you, Majid and Ron. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Diana Somerville, and I am the community manager at Bridge Hub. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which I'm meeting you here in Australia, uh, which is the Wiradjuri people. Pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So thank you to the Trans-Tasman Business Circle for uh, allowing Bridge Hub to, to be part of this great and um, really exciting conversation. Um, really, Bridge Hub uh, is here to help enhance that global connectivity that we will see here tonight. Um, today's or this evening's, this morning's, wherever we are sitting, uh, conversation uh, is really about food and water security as an example of that collaboration, uh, that working together that we have just heard uh, from Ron and Majid. And we have four superb panelists, uh, from one from each nation, to talk not only about um, their own business, but some of them about how they see the ecosystem where they are and the opportunity for collaboration across the four nations. So to start off, I'm uh, going to ask Buddy Bade to come on, um, uh, unmute and uh, join us and give us an introduction to himself, but also uh, to his business and the work that he's doing uh, for ag, uh, food and water security. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, welcome everyone uh, from Australia and New Zealand, and Israel and UAE. Uh, my name is Bader bin Mubarak, uh, the CEO and the owner representative of Fish Farm. Uh, a small introduction about Fish Farm. Fish Farm was established in 2015 uh, by the Conference of Dubai. The purpose of it was to uh, grow all kinds of species that we can't uh, grow in the UAE environment. And it was a big challenge at the beginning and uh, it took us around uh, three to four years to start uh, production. But Alhamdulillah, right now, we are uh, in the UAE as the biggest uh, fish farm in the UAE, from cage farm or a ras system, a land farm, and a hatchery uh, with five different uh, species, five organic species and five normal species. Uh, basically, what we do, and fish farm, we can create uh, any environment we want with, uh, we can copy uh, the Atlantic Ocean or the Mediterranean or the Pacific Ocean. Uh, we, we, we control the currents, speed, we control the tide, high tide, the low tide, the salinity. So for example, the salinity in the UAE is around 44% and in Atlantic Ocean is around 21 to 22%. We can make it to 22%. Uh, the temperature over here in the summer, if you know, it reaches up to 32 degrees Celsius. Uh, for example, the salmon needs a, a maximum of nine to 11. We can uh, reach the water, the temperature to nine and eight. Uh, we create also sunset and sunrise with the lightning, so deep sea and shallow waters. So we can basically create whatever environment we want, and this is what we have uh, the, the unique uh, part of fish farm, and it's uh, one of the rare ones in the world to have a fully controlled environment system. Uh, what is our main uh, purpose right now, uh, especially after the pandemic last year, is to cover uh, the food security in the UAE and to cover uh, all the 
demand that's happening in the UAE. Why? Because in the UAE, we have 92% of our uh, uh, fish is being imported. Uh, so in the food security aspect, this is a huge risk because we have around 200 nationalities in the UAE. And from these 200 nationalities, not all of them depend on the local species. This is why our target and goals, inshallah, is to reach before 2025 to have 60% of the market, uh, the market in the UAE. And fish farm is also in the, food, in, in the pandemic in 2020 uh, was assigned by the prime minister office uh, to be part of the food security national committee. We officially represent the aquaculture industry uh, in, in, in the UAE. This is about uh, a small uh, introduction about uh, fish farm. Uh, about the agri-food in the UAE, what's happening new in this industry? Uh, if, you, if, you, if you can see now the last years, last year and the year before, there is a huge uh, demand happening in the hydroponics industry. Last year, just four months ago, there was a, huge, a big signature that happened in Abu Dhabi for building the biggest uh, uh, hydroponic farm in the world. Also, there was an announcement last uh, month also with, I think, uh, an Israeli company is called Pure Salmon, who is creating uh, uh, 20,000 ton uh, of salmon farm, land farm, also in Abu Dhabi. So uh, there is, a, a, we can see a lot of invest investors coming around the world big investment and in a very big scale, not like what we were used to, you know, they're, they're talking about taking shares of different markets, not only UAE markets. So the, the agri-food, it's totally different than 2018. And now the, the whole uh, system in the UAE is being concentrated in food and water right now because of the pandemic. It has more concentration from the government and investors. What opportunity for uh, innovators and investors around the world uh, in the UAE? We, we have a program called the Government Accelerator Program. This has also been uh, produced by the Prime Minister's Office. The job of that program is to accelerate any, uh, any uh, law or any regulation or any procedure that you want, your job is to accelerate it in 30 days, even if it includes federal government, national government, private sectors. So we had this government accelerated program and we got with the ACTEC initiatives. The ACTEC initiative, there was what produced actually from there, we produced the data platform gathered from federal government entities and local government entities and from the private sectors. And now we have a data platform that for any investors can come and have an accurate data about what's happening here in, in the UAE. Uh, also, we created zone in the seven Emirates. Now we have zoning for aquacultures. We have zoning for hydroponics farm. So uh, for uh, normal farms. So now there is all zoning around the UAE available for you to have a land anywhere you want. Also, there is the farming rates for the electricities and utilities. Uh, also, now we have also something called the iFarm uh, license, which allows you to uh, have, so for example, in fish farm, we used to have seven license uh, to import our fish feed or to export our product or to uh, also, uh, have our farms in different uh, in different emirates. For every emirate, we have to have a license, and then for trading our fish in the market, we have to have a trading license. So now there is something called an I farm license. It allows you to import and export your your uh, utilities or your, your commodities. Uh, also, it allows you to trade your fish uh, or your, your products in the market, and it allows you to have branches any 
Emirates and any of the Emirates of the UAE. So now you have one stop, one license with a very small uh, fees. Before we had to pay a huge fees for every license. So this is some attractiveness uh, for investors here that we are trying to produce here in the UAE. Also in uh, ESMA, we have Emirates Standard uh, Authority. Uh, we have now created the ACTEC standard. So when we created the ACTEC standard, right now we allow the, the insurance company now can also insure your farms. Before we didn't have this in the UAE, we didn't have the insurance for the farms, for the fish farming, for the hydroponic farm, because there was no standard to base the uh, insurance risk on. Now there's an insure, there is a standard, the insurance now can analyze the risk, they allow insurances. And from that, the bank also, there is a code for every kind of farm now in the banking system. So, and there is a huge fund that has been subsidized by the government to the, to the central bank to finance all investors in the UE uh, through the banking system. This was also not there before. So, uh, plus in the UE we have one of the best logistics uh, entities uh, like Emirates Airline, like the DP World, uh, Tahad Airline, and also we have the the uh, the cargo uh, city where the, there is chillers for the standby, the transit. So it, we have the full infrastructure to allow you to reach to the world in a couple of hours. Uh, this is basically uh, all the opportunities that allows you here uh, to come to the UAE and invest in, in, in the UAE, and uh, uh, especially our neighbors, the Israelis uh, or the Australian or the, the New Zealand, we all have a very good relation. Me, myself, I was one of the first people to, to be in the first delegation to reach uh, Tel Aviv, Israel. I was surprised uh, from the welcoming we received from uh, our neighbor country, the Australian people. Uh, and please uh, feel free uh, to ask us any question you want uh, through email or through the, the platform. Thank you very much. Thank you, Beta, and um, wonderful to hear about the development uh, from 2018 through to now and the amount of opportunities um, that really uh, Majid spoke about unlocking that potential and you give a fantastic example of that. Thank you very much. I'd like to now uh, pass to Tomer uh, to give a quick introduction of himself and CropEx. Thanks, Tomer. Thank you. Um, how much time would you like me to uh, allocate to a CropEx introduction? I could speak for an hour. <laughs> Maybe five minutes would be would be great, Tommy. Yeah, five five minutes is plenty. So CropEx is uh, an ag tech and ag analytics uh, company um, out of Israel. Um, our solution is has two components to it. We have a, a hardware component and a software component. On the hardware side, it's essentially a, a soil sensor that we developed ourselves. It's very unique uh, for many reasons, but first and foremost, it's uh, essentially the only um, soil sensor that can um, scale. Um, the data that it collects is uh, very, very accurate. It comes at a very um, low cost. Um, and so that's on the hardware side. By the way, just by means of example, um, you know, uh, comparing to other companies out there. Uh, 2020 was a very difficult year for, for uh, many um, companies because they couldn't send out um, people to sell their technology to train uh, and to install. And the CropEx system, because it's so scalable, it's actually installed by the farmer in just five minutes. Uh, we made new installations in 2020 in probably 15 or more new countries, including um, Abu Dhabi and Japan and Uruguay and Paraguay and Senegal and Belize and, and many countries that we wouldn't even imagine. And of course, we don't have a uh, representation there. It's just that the system is very, very scalable and we're growing very fast in that respect. The other component to our system is a software, uh, an app that farmers download to their phone. And in the software, we connect the data that we get from the real-time data that we get from the soil from the sensors to all of the various data layers. So in our system today, we have satellite, we, uh, satellite data, we have weather data, we have soil data, we have topography, we have 
uh, more than 50 different crop models that we support. We close the loop with yield maps and with uh, as applied irrigation data from the various irrigation systems that we control, et cetera, uh, and, and much more. Um, and uh, by doing that, we're able to pro provide a lot of benefits to our farmers. So, you know, whether it's to save on um, irrigation, wh where, to, where to apply water, when and how much, uh, we, we save typically above 50% of the water by doing that. But we also save on energy and we save on labor and we increase yield and we do a lot of other things. Uh, we don't just do water, by the way, we also do uh, uh, fertility uh, and many other things. The reason that we're investing so um, strongly um, in the real-time data that's coming from the soil is that when you look at the um, ag tech uh, as a whole, it turns out that the vast majority of the companies are bringing their data only from above the ground. So satellite imagery and UAVs and drones and cameras that you put on the field, et cetera. And um, only a very limited of, uh, number of uh, companies uh, actually kind of masters what we call the master the insight from the soil. Now, the main issue with above the ground data is that it comes in too late. Um, so I don't know, for example, a plant that's not receiving enough water, enough fertilizer can typically, you know, suck off everything that it can from the root zone and from the stem. By the time you see something above the ground, it could be two weeks after the fact. There's just nothing you can do about it. But with our data today, uh, we can be predictive, we can be preventive, uh, because we know what's going to hit the plant before the plant knows, uh, which is the, the true advantage of, uh, of the, the system and the combination of hardware, software, and, uh, and agronomy. So um, that's kind of really um, CropEx in a, in a nutshell. We're 45 employees today. We were founded in New Zealand, actually. Um, so today we have uh, um, five people in New Zealand. We have two in Australia. Um, and the vast majority is still in Israel. That's where the technology happens. And, and most of the commercial arm is out of the United States. We have 10 people there. Um, so that's uh, uh, CropEx. Thanks, Tomer, and um, it's fantastic hearing that story, like, like Johnny alluded to, the fact that this was born in New Zealand and, and in Israel now, in Australia, and, and just starting some work in the UAE. Um, so thank you very much for, for outlining what you do and uh, also linking us back to those amazing opportunities in Israel. Um, talking about New Zealand, uh, I would now like to throw over the ditch uh, to Amos uh, to introduce uh, himself and, and the role that he plays within the agri-food tech space in New Zealand and, and more broadly. Thanks, Amos. Thanks, Diana. Kia ora. Greetings to everyone. Great to be on the, the panel this evening. And I work for uh, two sort of main hats that I wear. Uh, food HQ, which is a, a collaboration in food science and commercialization of food science technologies. And I also work for an early stage accelerator called Sprout. And essentially uh, uh, in Sprout, we work with uh, CRIs, universities, and general markets to commercialize and accelerate their technology development. And we're seeing a huge amount of um, water security, water sustainability approach to startups. And just as of January, we're really excited to announce that we have a $40 million fund um, associated with Sprout now. And the companies that we accelerate, we now have the capability to invest in um, and scale them up. And we're really excited to work with uh, countries like Israel, uh, Australia, um, and the UAE, all of which have had much bigger challenges historically with water, drought, and dryness and arid uh, soil. So, we think we have a, a huge amount to learn, and I think we um, have a, a great opportunity to develop relationship in that, that water and sustainability space. So thank you. Thanks, Amos. Um, and now I'd like to pass to Stu Adams uh, to tell us a little bit about Agronomai uh, and his journey. Um, over to you, Stu. Thank you very much, Di. Uh, so at Agronomy, we are creating uh, really rich digital environments or replicas of uh, farmland. So digitizing entire farming systems uh, using planes uh, and low aerial imagery uh, to capture really rich visual maps and elevation layers of, of farms. So we can have a really uh, in-depth look at the landscape. Uh, and the main reason we uh, do that is related to water and uh, water security by running an algorithm with Australia's chief science agency in Australia, CSIRO, related, related to the flow of water across the landscape. So we can make more informed decisions related to the uh, placement of a dam, 
uh, where you're going to get erosion risk, uh, where you might get waterlogging. So all these factors that are going to limit productivity on a landscape and also the sustainability of that landscape. Um, obviously, landscape and water are very tied. Uh, and the success of any farm is, is tied to its water use efficiency. So at its core, what Agronomy is doing is creating these really strong digital foundations of the entire farming system, and then looking at many ways in which we can analyze that data to create further insights for a farmer to have more confidence around, around a decision and, and making a positive impact on the land that they farm. So um, in enabling another a number of technologies as well is, is at the core of what Agronomy does. So Tom Ayer's uh, technology as a sensor, how is that sensor related to the, the landscape, the topography, the water um, flow across that landscape as well. So it's sort of a, a platform to build more and more technology on top of and create uh, greater insights for farmers to make more informed uh, and confident decisions related to their farm. Thanks, Stu. Um, great to hear a great Australian innovation uh, at the table as well. So I'm just going to, to throw back just to a few of our panellists with a few questions, but I do uh, remind you if you have questions from the audience, because we have such a large audience, which is fantastic, um, we would like you to put your questions in, in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, so thank you, Bob. I see you've already popped one in there. Um, so Tommy, I just wanted to jump back to you. Um, and, and one of the questions I wanted to ask you is sort of bringing it out of the water uh, and food security space, but asking you for your perspective on, on what, what's really changing and what are those trends across the whole agri-food sector? Um, well, I'll try to, I'll try to limit my, uh, um, my answer to um, ag tech and, and maybe, maybe specifically for water. Um, so I think I think yeah, I joined this industry about four four years ago. I'm not an I'm not an ag tech guy by uh, by trade or by training. Uh, I come from from uh, other other disciplines and and especially uh, um, the internet domain, which is very different. Um, you know, uh, I, I see that ag tech on one hand has you know many advantages. Uh, it's a very very large market. Um, very um, agriculture is very underserved in terms of technology. There's a lot of technology that needs to be given um, to agriculture. Um, the macroeconomics are definitely there. Um, like you know, we definitely need to feed more people, um, and and in many places of the world, uh, water is running out, etc. But I think the main um, issue with this uh, um, industry is it tends to be slow uh, in terms of its adoption of, of technology. That has to do with, I think, uh, behaviors of, uh, of the end users, of the farmers, you know, they're risk of, of, um, adverse and won't blindly adopt tech. Um, I think also seasonality has uh, something to do with it. Um, specifically for water, you know, it, it, and this is kind of this, uh, this deviates between uh, different places across the globe, but in some places water is still cheap and, and so farmers just use it as insurance. They'd rather kind of over irrigate um, than, than risk uh, um, under irrigating and then potentially lose some, some, um, some yield. Um, so what's this causing, I think over time is, um, is for a consolidation in this industry. Uh, because on one hand, you see more and more, um, um, more and more funds that are going into ag tech because of the macroeconomics. But on the other hand, um, there have been a lot of small companies out there that have been uh, unable to grow because of the slowness. Uh, and so over the past two or three years, uh, and I see this, uh, I definitely see this accelerating now uh, due to COVID, et cetera. Um, there's a, definitely a consolidation trend that's uh, begun. Uh, we specifically at CropEx, we have acquired um, two, two, companies, uh, um, two companies in 2020. One of them was in New Zealand, um, another one in um, Lincoln, Nebraska. And um, I expect that we will definitely see more and more consolidation plays as, um, um, with time. Thanks, Tom Ayer. And um, yeah, definitely a trend uh, emerging there with consolidation. And, and you spoke uh, there just about an acquisition in, in um, New Zealand. So Amos, I might throw to you uh, just, just with a, a question. Um, you, you, when you spoke, you spoke about um, learning from other countries uh, in terms of water and water management. And I know uh, in New Zealand, often when we talk about water security, it, it's often around water quality. Um, and I think that there's a lot that the rest of us um, can learn from you uh, and New Zealand in the work that's already been done in the water quality space. Do you see much coming across 
uh, from research or new innovations in that area um, in New Zealand? Yeah, definitely. It's a, it's a huge focus and I think it's one of the sustainability aspects that's quite proximate to people and quite tangible. So it's interesting with the with greenhouse gas emissions, they are kind of abstract for people, but people can drive past uh, farm waterways or rivers and they can get a sense by just looking at it that there's something not quite right. It could be algae blooming from excess nitrates or nutrients in the water, or it could be a, a, some other diversion of the stream from agriculture um, contribution. So there's a, a, quite a, a focus on water quality because it can be quite tangible. And the response to that is actually amazing innovation. So we have a, we have a company actually right now in the accelerator that's using a, a, um, a bioreactor that actually sits in the, the water and uses a, um, a microbial filter to take the nitrates out uh, of the water. So it's a denitrification process that can do about 150,000 liters of, of water a day and it sits on a, a riverway and it can help to offset some of the contribution of, of nitrates in the water. And the nitrates get there for exactly the reason that, that Tom spoke of, which is farmers tend to, in New Zealand, they tend to over irrigate when they do, and it causes a wash off of excess fertilizers and nutrients into the, the waterways. Um, but water is one of those things that's really complex. So we have a, a great um, and, and elegant technology solution there. The challenge is who should pay for that? Because if you think about a, a farming system, if you're responsible for the waterway that goes through your farm or your property, doesn't necessarily mean that the contaminants or the excess nitrates or nutrients in the water have come from you. They could have come from a, a stream or a waterway further up that someone else has been responsible for. So it's one of these topics that even when you have a great tech solution, it's actually really difficult to find the, the product market fit and understanding who and when should pay for what. And it's usually a, a collaboration that ends up happening between a group of farmers around the water catchment and then also some of the, the regulatory bodies around the assigning of sort of responsibility. So it's a, it's a really interesting and challenging space because you have the, the technology solutions, but then you also have the sort of um, challenges of trying to, to manage the implementation and, and user pay system for it. Yeah, and I think that really uh, emphasises what Tomea was talking about with adoption um, as well. So yeah, gr great. Thank you, Amos. And Badea, I just wanted to touch base quickly here and, and ask you, in, in the work that you're doing with Fish Farm, um, is, you know, working in terms of water quality uh, a big issue? And uh, you spoke about uh, the ag tech standards, which was fantastic. Is there anything in that that talks about water quality? Yeah, definitely, Diana. The whole, uh, the whole secret is about the water quality, actually, in fish farming. The main two things we have in fish farming that uh, uh, pretend your uh, product is the fish feed and the water quality. This is why we have a very strong uh, filtration system, actually, while, while receiving the water from the, the sea. It goes through nine filtration systems totally different kind of uh, system from biofilters to UVs to uh, uh, drum filters, uh, a lot of kind of filter that goes through, through also sand filters, or holes in the middle of the sea. So definitely the water quality is the main uh, thing we work on here in Fish Farm. Thank you. And uh, again, I think that just demonstrates an opportunity for collaboration. Um, and Amos, you spoke about um, the visible and the non-visible um, types of uh, types of agriculture or things that are out there within agriculture being, you know, water quality. Stu, I want to talk to you. You, you. you obviously work in that water flow space, but there's a lot happening underneath the ground that water has a lot to do with. Um, do you want to speak a little bit more about the application of that and what the other big challenges we are facing here in agriculture and the big opportunities? Yeah, I, I think speaking to that um, the opportunity, uh, I think we're seeing now that governments are trying to incentivize uh, growers and landowners to, to work together towards a common goal of sustainability and, and uh, net neutrality and, and all these types of things. So it's that shift from a, a ruling with, with a stick to ruling with a carrot. 
And to rule with a carrot, there has to be confidence that that farmer or that landowner is actually utilising their landscape um, to the best of its ability, or at least trying to implement projects related to, you know, the most uh, high potential area on the farm. So uh, when we look at the, the water flowing through that, that landscape and, and what it's doing um, to erosion, water quality, obviously that's a huge driver for some of these sustainable metrics and, and the ability to, to measure. You can't manage what you can't measure. Um, so the ability to create these measurement tools, not only related to water, but biodiversity. So looking at the landscape, where is the best place to put some um, tree plantings that we are therefore going to introduce more native species and biodiversity corridors in the best place possible. So we're in you know, Australia at the moment, the way we are doing it is uh, um, people in white vans driving around the country with clipboards trying to figure out what is actually happening on the ground. That's not a scalable solution. So how do we use these technologies and tools uh, to open up some of those channels and give government organisations and private organisations confidence that if they're paying a grower, to improve their landscape because it's aligned with biodiversity or carbon net neutrality, um, that that is actually happening in that in that region. And then using tools like um, technology to, to measure that improvement over time. So how is the soil reacting? How are we using some other satellite complementary technologies to improve or um, uh, measure that improvement over time? So that there are assurances that we are paying for a single carbon credit. We are getting that uh, credit and, and using it once. It's not been doubled up and um, these sorts of issues that we're obviously um, struggling with at the moment to enable that um, the, those incentives to start to flow and therefore improve the landscape which we farm and uh, we rely on for that food and water security. Yeah, I really think carbon's emerging as, as, a, as a huge opportunity uh, for the agricultural sector. I'm just going to throw to one of the questions from the audience that ties into that and it, it's not necessarily about carbon itself, but I'm sure it, 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 this will flow into the answers. But the question is, how will climate change significantly change the industry? Um, and I'd just like to throw to our panel to see if anyone would like to, to grab that one. <laughs> so yeah, just talking about, um, about climate change, climate variability and how it can and, and, and may change the industry as a whole. I'm happy to have a quick crack at that. And right. I think it's, it's interesting to think of it as two um, ends of a spectrum where it's, what, what are the actual physical effects of the, the planet warming up or climate change happening? And who will that perhaps displace or put food security at, at risk? And then what are the expectations of consumers in terms of what does a, a sustainable um, food proposition look like to a global market? And that's probably more on the side where I focus a lot because, you know, our premium sort of brand of food and beverage in the marketplace and, and UAE is one of our, our strong trading partners in that space. You know, these customers and the consumers, we're hearing feedback from them that they want consideration of, of a longer term view of, of the world and how that food production is affecting it. And so we, I think when we talk with um, businesses, industry, consumers, everyone's quite aligned that the, the future of, of um, food production needs to, to radically transform to be coming in line with the expectations from some of those key markets where we deliver food um, as an export to. So that's, uh, that's my crack at it. Thanks. Anyone else want to come in and comment on that one? We might um, throw to the next question and, and oh, yep, yeah, Tom Air, thanks. Yeah, sure. Just from uh, from kind of our our um, small um, universe, what what we see is uh, because of the kind of uh, erratic changes in, in weather and especially in, in uh, patterns of rain, um, you know, you just see that more and more people are installing irrigation systems over time uh, because that needs to uh, be under control. And especially, even I think a good example was uh, we've seen that in our backyard here in Europe. Like where I think it was uh, all over the news that I think two years ago, uh, due to a severe drought um, you know, in, in Germany, McDonald's there um, ran out of uh, French fries, didn't have enough potatoes. And, and, and you see that more and more uh, lands that have been traditionally non-irrigated, uh, rain-fed only, are now uh, trying to uh, hedge, hedge their kind of uh, risks and bets by, by applying and, um, irrigation. I can't imagine a world without McDonald fries. That would be terrible. I, I actually can't, but um, that's a <laughs> personal taste. 
Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Tommy. And, and you spoke about your own universe or your small universe. And, and it's something that we all have in common. We all come from countries that are reasonably small, be that in size or population. And one of the questions from the, from the audience is how do you scale up to meet that larger global competitors that, you know, are coming from a larger base? And, and Tommy, I'll, I will come back, probably straight back to you on this one because, you, you know, you have done that already and then maybe whoever else would like to jump in. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I agree. And at least, you know, from our perspective, what we're trying to try to do from day one, and I, I think that we've succeeded, is create a system uh, that has a, that's very scalable by nature. Um, and that, I think, helps us um, overcome uh, the, the traditional slowness of, of this industry. Um, so that's that's uh, by means of technology in this respect. Um, of course, other other and additional solutions that we apply, for example, are just you know you're applying certain go-to-market strategies that might be might be different, and util, util, utilizing a very strong uh, network of uh, strategic investors, etc. So it's uh, you know you 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 do whatever you can, um, and and uh, it's it's producing the results. And Beta, what, what challenges do you see in scaling up to, to meeting that larger global global competitors? Oh. Just on mute. Uh, Thank sorry you. For the money. Uh, actually, uh, it's it's I don't think there there is a lot of challenge. It's, it's just a matter of time, you know. We we are going on the right way and we, we are meeting our milestones. And I think it's just a matter of time to reach. Yes, definitely. And, and I guess going back to Tomer's points about um, building as an actual scalable product and, and systems and processes and being allowed, allowing it to, to have that basis to, to then grow and, and scale and compete globally. Um, thank you. And, and just you, you spoke about time. Um, and even though we're slowly running out of time on this call, we have um, much time ahead of us uh, from leading from this conversation and, and what, is, what has happened over the last 12 months. And, and one of the questions which comes from Bob was, uh, once the successes are noticeable for everyone to see, how do you envisage an expansion of the Abraham Accords in five years' time? Uh... Right, right now, uh, if, you, if you see Diana, we, we have been visited by almost uh, 28 delegation from, from Israel. Uh, we have signed three MOUs already with them. Now we will be starting also uh, to have a franchise of fish farm also in Tel Aviv in, in, in the very next future, maybe by end of this year. So there is a huge collaboration going on now between us in Israel, as if we we have this relation since 50 years, actually, not just a couple of months. So things are going very fast with them. There's a lot of signing agreements that happen with them. People have started companies over here already in the UAE. And also we have started giving franchise to a lot of our products to Israel already. Thank you. And I think this really leads into, um, we did receive some questions before uh, tonight's event. Um, and a lot of those were around how do we now look at look at that opportunity um, as time comes through? Um, what are those opportunities that you see for these four nations to work together? And, and where do you see, uh, see that potential coming from? And, and what's really needed to make that happen? Um, Stu, have you got uh, any, any? Oh, sorry, but there. Uh, there, uh, Diana, if you, if you can see now, uh, the expo is coming very near. Uh, and it's all about the connectivity and the connection between uh, societies and countries. Uh, and I think New Zealand, Australia, and Israel, UAE, everyone in this aspect has a strength that definitely we can all use and put them together and create something out of it. Uh, we have here the infrastructure and logistics, uh, strong financial support from the government and uh, in Israel and Australia and, and, and New Zealand, 
they have the uh, innovative uh, engineers and they have these new ideas of all uh, coming and technologies and plus uh, that they have also the, the historical data in every product they have produced that we, we are still young in. Definitely, if you put all of this together, you, you can really create something big over it. True, power, power in numbers and collaboration. I, I couldn't agree more. Stu, did you want to add yeah. to that? I think that it's clear that you know that this is a major challenge, opportunity, whichever way you want to put it. But farming and agriculture is very complex. Whether it's agriculture, agriculture, irrigated, non-irrigated, it's a very complex um, problem that we're facing. So there's no point in reinventing the wheel, right? Like if there's um, people in different corners of the world that are achieving really great milestones and and developing technologies that are useful, whether it be in Australia or you know. Um, using that in New Zealand, for instance, like New Zealand probably has too much water in their agricultural systems. We don't have enough, but the way in which our technology from agronomy, our perspective around water, well, in Australia, we've got to try and capture as much water as possible. In New Zealand, it's about managing that water and that movement of water in the most efficient way that doesn't ruin the environment. So while it might not be directly transferable, I'm using our own backyards as test beds and then understanding what the problem is, say over in New Zealand, not far away, or, you know, um, in the UAE to you know, a, a advance the agricultural sector over there. I think that the, these, these opportunities and um, this collaboration uh, for a huge problem, there's no, in, no point in reinventing the wheel as, as we move through it. Let's um, innovate and move forward together. Great, thanks, thanks Stu, and I couldn't agree more. Uh, Amos or Tomé, do you have any remarks on, on how we move forward and what those opportunities may be between these four nations? Yeah, I think that the best way to move forward is to jump on a, a Trans-Tasman Business Circle trade delegation or trade mission. You know, relationships are what is most key to it. I think and they'll pay later for that plug. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what, I, what I've seen and, and I've worked across multiple countries is more than anything, it's that person-to-person -person connectivity that creates stickability in relationships that then spawn into projects and then projects become business and commercial opportunities. So I think it, it really is about taking the time to, to visit and um, be hosted in each country and get to understand um, what the, the innovation is that that country can offer and perhaps what the opportunity is for um, your country to deliver um, innovation. So it's often seeing is believing and you get a really good grasp of, of where the complementary um, activity is once you get there and engage. So um, I think this is the best precursor to it and then we're, we're on a plane and we're shaking hands and we're, we're out in the fields together. Oh, I look forward to that day and hopefully it's not too far away for all of us to be uh, jumping on a plane and, and traveling and, and meeting each other in person and speaking from my own experience that spending time in Israel, spending time in New Zealand had really opened my eyes to that level of understanding and opportunity for collaboration and really hope that I can do the same with the UAE. Um, Tomé, you've joined us back. I'm not sure if you're you're still, still uh, available, but um, the final question that we've got from the audience, which uh, I think is a fantastic one to, to finish on before I, I pass over to Tanya to close, is as leaders in, in your areas, what keeps you awake at night? And Tomé, no, it's not the loss of McDonald chips from the world market. Um, so Amos, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I would probably say the, the thing that keeps me awake at night is the complex systems that the food, um, the, the global food ecosystem is, and that in reality, we often have the ability and resources to produce enough food. It's just not the right food in the right place at the right time. So I do wonder that, you know, there's a huge emphasis on um, the technology development and innovation. But it's also, you know, the thing that keeps me up at night is, will that really make a breakthrough in terms of the transformational change that we need if it's not integrated into a whole systems approach? So that's what, um, that's what stops me from sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Vader, what keeps you up at night? Uh, you know, uh, all our business is based on the livestock, you know. 
and and that makes me worried all the time, you know, that anything happened to this livestock, <laughs> nothing else. You know. Immediately we can lose everything <laughs> in a couple of seconds. That but it makes me worry. Well, I completely understand that. <laughs> Very valid, valid reason. But I mean, I think that's what makes us all entrepreneurs um, and innovators is that we're willing to take that risk for the for the benefit and, and the opportunity that comes from it. Stu, what keeps you awake awake at night? My seven-week-old daughter. <laughs> well played. <laughs> um, no, I, I think it's just having the patience. I think it kind of goes to Beta's um, comment and Amos as well. It's it's complex and there needs to be patience. Uh, I say this all the time that farmers aren't sitting around waiting for us to come and save the day. Um, they will get on with what they need to do on a daily basis. Um, so it's that patience and, and realising that you need to have um, rubber on the road, runs on the board, whatever um, saying you want to, you have, but you know, you need to prove out the technology and, and believe in what you're doing, but have that patience as well, that it's going to land in the hands of the right people and it's going to have an impact. But um, yeah, it's just that ags are a big, slow moving beast that um, sometimes takes a long time to, you know, adopt technology and, and how are governments sort of enabling and um, incentivizing users to, to, up, to uptake technology that's going to be better for not only their production, but uh, the global uh, environment as well. Great, Stu. And, and yes, it's a challenge for, for all of us, no matter where we are, is how we bring the right people around the table to make the right decisions. Um, Tom Air, you, you dropped off there before, but I, we're just asking the question as to our final question for tonight is, is what keeps you up at night? Kids? That one's already been taken. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry, I dropped off. Um, uh let me think about that for a second i don't know it's uh you know after uh being an, an uh, a ceo and an entrepreneur for several years you kind of get the point you wake up in the morning you look at your in inbox uh and uh, you see what's going to piss you off uh and and most of the things you know are not going to kill you um so you kind of just get used to it um I, i'm not sure that anything at this point uh kind of keeps me up at night um but uh, um, as every, you know, this Arctic is not different um, than any other industry, whether it's cybersecurity or internet or um, whatever. I mean, every, every industry has, has its challenges. Every startup has its challenges. Um, at the end of the day, it's always the same. Um, and you need to just uh, do your best and uh, um, continue, um, you know, never give up. Great, and what wonderful words to, to finish on. Um, thank you all. I, I will pass over to Tanya in a moment to, to, to wrap up um, uh, from this evening's uh, uh, discussion. But for myself, I, uh, this has been really invigorating and I really do look to the future um, as something bright and something that's inclusive uh, for all of us. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you to the panel. It was such a pleasure. Um, Tanya? Over to you. Oh, Diana, thank you so much. Expertly moderated, really. Um, such a fascinating discussion. And of course, we could have gone on for so much longer. But really, to, to have you all here with us together is really quite um, special and, and unique. And it's really just shows what amazing times we're all living in. Beta, for you to say that, you know, you've had 28 delegations already come, MOU sign, it just shows the times we're living in. And we really are fortunate to be seeing, you know, peace through agriculture and seeing that Agri is actually bringing um, our nations together, our four beautiful nations together from the corners of the world. So it's really been an incredible conversation and so much more to come. We're just beginning and imagine if COVID hadn't been and what we could have achieved during that. So, so much more to come and, and really the best is yet to come. So very inspirational by all of you. I really want to thank our speakers, Beta, Stu, um, Tome, and of course, Amos. It's been wonderful. We've been working with you in the background, trying to get this together. And I really want to thank you on behalf of the circle. We're committed to this cause. We're committed to bringing the best of Australia and New Zealand uh, to the UAE and to Israel. And we do hope for better times. And we are looking forward to being there February 2022. 
So on that note, I will thank you all for being with us, all our guests who have joined us. And please, if you need any further information, please reach out to the circle. We'll be more than happy to connect you all um, and wish you good morning. Laila Tov, Erev Tov, Shalom, good night, and uh, best to everyone from all over. And Salam, Shalom. Bye, everyone.